Well, you're going to be drinking again today uh, from the fire hydrant. We're going to we're going to go hard here. You have to listen hard, okay? Because we're going to go. Uh, so um, we're going to pick up where we left off from last week, um, and, and that is the same same thing. We're talking about us becoming disciple makers, and and this is what I want for you because this is what I have come to learn in, in my following of Jesus that I want to I want to I want to be all that scripture says that I am. I want I want to live like it and I want to have the impact in, in life like the Bible says. Um, and and I, I know and, and I, I say this respect <laughs> there's a lot of things I find myself saying I say this respectfully because I want to challenge Christians, all right? So I don't want to insult anybody or hurt anybody's feelings, but if, if hurting your feelings, if I if I could maybe I could say it in love, right? If, if I could say something that might hurt your feelings, but I say it in love, but it would help open our eyes, right? That's what we want. We want our eyes to be open yes. so we can see our calling and, and, and have impact in the world. Because we believe the book is true, right? We if we we believe this book is true that means there's some people not going to make it to heaven that's right truth and there's only one other alternative and annihilation is not it it's hell and we want to rescue people from that and so so that's my my challenge to you as a believer that you see yourself as God sees you and and first of all, into a relationship with him, to, uh, to go to the world capable. Listen, this, uh, this third one down here, the fourth one down here, capable. You, we are complete in Christ. We have all of Christ in us, and we are learning to appropriate what God has given us. But this thing of, of capable and becoming capable, you become more capable, all right? Again, not that you need more of Jesus, I mean, but we have all of him, but you realize what you have in Christ if you step out and start sharing your faith. Philemon 1 6 says, I pray you be active in sharing your faith so that you will know. There's a transitional <laughs> phrase there. So you will know. Share your faith so you will know all that you have in Christ. And so that's what I want for you. And this is what I continue to learn. Man, I want my life to match the, the calling of God. I want my life to match the sacrifice that Christ gave on my behalf. Now, again, you know, I don't want to be too abrasive, but um, I'll just say this. I talked with a pastor, and it's not, not this pastor. I talked with a pastor once. He said, I have a, I have a member in my church who came, and, they, and, they, and they, they said, I've been coming to church for 40 years, and I don't read my Bible. I want... I wanted to say, well, did you introduce them to Jesus? I mean, like, I mean, so these things happen and they ought not to. So uh, if you're walking with Jesus, Jesus said, come and follow. He didn't say, come and sit. Now it's fine to come and sit on Sunday morning. That's what we do. But we, what happens in here is supposed to impact out there, right? Yes. All right. So, with, okay. So I'm, <laughs> with that said, you know, we're going to keep trying to go here. So. This was this is so huge. If you could learn, you know, the width, just be with God, just enjoy His presence. Know that He's a good Father and He loves you and He enjoys your company. Rather than think I got to get something out of my quiet time, and if I if I'm reading my Bible and I'm not getting anything out of it, well then my time with God is a failure. But listen, if you can just if you can learn to just be with God. The thing that needs to happen is going to take care of itself. You, you, you will get something. You'll get him. You'll get his insight. You'll get his wisdom. You'll get being with God. The world doesn't need us trying to be somebody else, that somebody that we're not. They, they need us to be authentic believers in Christ and loving them the way Jesus loved them. So if we could just get, get um, past the get something out of my quiet time, to the just be with God, enjoy His presence, know that He loves me, and 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 I and I um, and I am loved by Him. Uh, it will do wonders for our walk with God. So the first thing in your notes there <clears throat> in the bulletin, if you want to, if you want to uh, become a, a disciple maker, first thing you got to do is you got to spend time with God. We said last week, you know, the first, one of the first things you got to make sure is that you yourself are a disciple of Jesus. Well, instead of you, uh, if, you, if, you if you're if you not a disciple of Jesus, you can't make disciples of Jesus. 
But if you actually are following, then you're able to teach someone else how they can follow. And so <clears throat> time with God and time with your disciples. So the Bible is authoritative and reliable, and, uh, and, and we're going to believe uh, God's word. And so <clears throat> this was just to kind of motivate you to think a little bit about your quiet time. You know, you read, you listen, and you ask questions, and you read a little bit more, and then you resist, right? You resist the urge to lead. I challenge... Um, guys that I'm discipling to, to spend um, two months in Psalm 139, 1 through 18. Just 18 verses. If you can stay in 18 verses for for two months, it would it would change your life. Because you're gonna you're gonna want to leave. You're gonna want you're gonna say, man, I've read this verse 20 times. I've, done, I've learned everything I need to learn out of that those those 18 verses. And now here it is the 20th of the month. I've read, I've read enough. No, <clears throat> what you want to do in your quiet time is you want to let scripture conquer you. You should write that down. You want to let scripture conquer you. You don't want to read through the Bible and say, uh, you know, I read through the Bible and pat yourself on the back. Right? I mean, that's good. Read the Bible. You should read through the Bible, all right? But if you read through the Bible and you don't let the Bible conquer your prejudice, you need to read it again. If you read through the Bible and you don't let your the Bible conquer your pride, you need to read it again. Right, and so when we're reading scripture, we want to let it conquer my misinformation, my lack of information. I want to let the Bible conquer my apathy, my indifference. Right, that's what we want when we're reading God's word, and then ultimately, we're compelled to share what we've uh, learned from God and from being with God with the world. And so, resist the urge to speak. <laughs> God, I had, did you know, you know about it? And we start telling him, right? Well, he knows, right? And then resist, resist the urge to leave and just stay. I mean, I don't know if you've ever had your grandkids around or your sons or your daughters around and they left and you were just, you just, there was this empty feeling, of, a feeling of, of loss because they left. I think that's the way God feels when we're with him, he enjoys it. And when we, we, you know, we, read a little bit and then we say a lot we don't listen any and then we leave he's like I had I had so much more for you but you won't stop talking <laughs> and you left yeah. and so it's for us to resist the urge to speak and tell God what he already knows and it's for us to resist the urge to to leave his presence. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, this question is, you know, do I put this question up there, <laughs> and of course the answer, you know, these, these are my grandchildren, and they're learning to walk, and, um, and that's me on the ride in the shadow, uh, and, and little Abraham, and we're walking down the street. Right, but the question, for you, the question that you might ask your disciple be careful asking this question, but do I have to come over there? I don't know if you ever had anybody, you know, ask you that. Do I have to come over there and hold your hand, <laughs> right? And they're like, well, it looks like I do, right? Well, that's true for us, us in making disciple makers too. We got people stumbling around making uh, unwise decisions and getting themselves in trouble. And, 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 and we look at them and we're discipling them and we say, well, do I have to come over there and hold your hand? And they're probably going to say no. But inside you're saying, yes, I do. Yeah, I'm going to come hold your hand while, while I'm helping you walk with the Lord. And what we want is for our disciple to start feeding themselves, right? Now, this is a little deacon. Is he choose a button or what? Yeah. Ha, I'm telling you what. Look at that face. He got the ketchup on that finger and he eats it, right? And, and so what we want is for them to be able to feed themselves. And that boy, he's not going to eat a tomato. What two-year-old do you know is going to eat it? I mean, maybe. Um, but he didn't want that tomato. He started to put that thing down. Watch what he does with that french fry. Oh, yeah. They're going to feed themselves. See, this is real simple, but come on. This is what you want for your disciple. This is what you want for somebody that you're pouring your life into. You want them to be able to read God's word and feed themselves rather than depend on the preacher over there. I mean, it's good. And it's even good to a point to depend on you if you're discipling somebody for them to depend on you. That's okay. It's okay for a little while, but you know, we want to 
as we're discipling, we want to close the window of dependence. We want to close the window where they depend on you to tell, to tell them what's in this book. They need to be reading it for themselves. <clears throat> now, this is a picture. I'm at Union Grove High School here, and I'm talking about this. I'm talking about last week, you know, I had the, um, had the baton, and all of these batons that you see in each of their hands, they have something um, written on them. Uh, one of them says pray, one of them says share the gospel, one, one of them says overcome temptation, uh, the other one says read my Bible. And so I'm, what I'm saying to them is uh, my disciple says, I don't know how to read my Bible. I say, that's okay. And I hand off the baton, right? I'll teach you how to read your Bible, right? With the intent that you would grow and then you would do what with it? Teach somebody else. Now watch what happens when I hand this next baton off. It was just so perfect. Uh, watch, watch what these guys do. I, I, I don't know how to read my Bible. That's okay. Watch, watch it happen. <laughs> perfect. That's a perfect picture of discipleship where I pass off how to read your Bible, how to overcome temptation, how to clarify and share the gospel to my disciple. And what does he do? He receives it and then he passes it on to somebody else. That's such a perfect picture of discipleship. So last week I gave this Bible study sheet. I got some here. I have a second uh, simple Bible study sheet for you here that you can get one, a copy of. And so we're going to kind of walk through this super quick. Um, and this is what you want. So there's, there's a place for 500 level uh, seminary study of theology and ethics and all those things. Right. But the average person out there doesn't necessarily need that. They can get it. But they don't necessarily need it. They're going through all the struggles of, of you know, of that, that their family's going through, all the stuff that, that we face in everyday life. We don't need these high platitudes, um, you know, thrown at them. They need nuts and bolts, simple, how do I follow Jesus? And we believe that you start following Jesus by coming to church and reading God's word. Well, I don't know how to read my Bible. I let the preacher tell me what's in it. No, that's not the way it's supposed to be. That's part of the way it's supposed to be. But you're supposed to... Pastor don't want you coming in every week and you don't read your Bible. He would love for you to come in and tell him what, he, what you learned this week in your, in your Bible study. Amen. He would love for you to come in and tell, and tell him about the, the, the relationship of the, the, the guy or the lady that you're discipling. Amen. He would love for you to come in and tell him about how you sh shared the gospel with somebody. Yes. Amen. All right. So that's what we're, that's what we're, this bo simple Bible study sheet is for. It's for you, but it's for you to give to somebody else. So for you to give to your disciple, all right? So what I do is I just circle whatever book I'm in. Matthew, Mark, this is designed for the Gospels. You can also use the book of Acts, uh, but it, it's designed for the Gospels. So I just circle, I just, I'm real simple, right? I just circle what book I'm in, all right? And then I write down, write down the passage. And then it has these questions. Now, if you've ever trained somebody in your business, whatever your occupation has been over, over the last years, if you ever trained somebody, you know you're going to recognize this because this is exactly what um, what we're what we're talking about. So, look at this first question down here at the bottom. It says, "At this point, so you've circled what book you're in, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and let's just say John chapter two. It's real simple, John two, all right? Uh, John two, um, and we're uh, um, turning the water into wine, right? Wedding at Cana, right? And so." Uh, at, at this point in their relationship with Jesus, what have the 12 heard Jesus say or, or teach and what have they seen him do? Now we can safely say it's John chapter two. So we can kind of safely say probably not a whole lot. Now fast forward to a week before the, re the crucifixion resurrection. If we ask this sec same question, what has uh, at this point, right? Now we're three years later. This is just a few months, a few months into his relationship with the disciples, this wedding at Cana. And if we fast forward to a week before the crucifixion and resurrection, at that point, what does Jesus uh, expect them to, to know? Well, he expects them to know a lot because he spent time with them, right? There's a difference between a couple months, which is in John chapter 2, and, a, and, a, and three years, which is John 21, John 8, 19, 20, right? 
there's a lot of conversations that have been had, right? Right. So that's what these questions here are designed to uh, to reveal. How did the how did the, and I got hard copies up here for you. If you weren't here last week, you can come up. You can get a couple of these. Take them home with you. There's two actually, and you can get that second one also. So and then there's other questions like at this point in the relationship, um, um, one on one conversation, one on one conversations have. What do you um, what what do we know uh, that they talked about? So you can read in the text and say, well, they talked about this, and then you write it down. So this is real simple. Um, but it, this is designed, this sheet here on the left that I passed out last week, is designed to reveal the timeline of their growth. Now, why would we do that? Because you have a timeline of your own personal growth. If you just got saved three, uh, three years ago, you maybe got saved 40 years ago. All right? There is a timeline of your growth. And so we could ask this question at any point, drop it in on your life and say, at this point in your life, been listening to the pastor, you've been reading God's word for 30 years, what does Jesus expect you to know and do? Right? And, and the reason I asked you about your career and what, in case you've ever trained somebody, well then you're going to ask the same thing. You're going to send somebody through three hours worth of training and you expect them to, to be able to come out of that and then be able to, to start doing whatever that thing is you train them to do. There's the expectation. All right? And it's the same for us that we um, follow that way. All right, so here we are. Um, this is kind of a, a, um, a debriefing uh, in a sense, but uh, the, the, here are 10 events. Oh my gosh, which 10 do you pick, Pastor? You know, I mean, they're all, the, the dynamic of the relationship between Jesus and his disciples, Jesus helping them connect the dots from the kingdom of God to going to work on Monday. I mean, gee, there's so many of those events in there, so I just picked 10 of them, and I did, there was some strategy to, to what I picked, but that's what we did. So this, John 2, 1 through 12, is just a few months into Jesus' ministry. That's, the, that's the, um, uh, the wedding at Canaan, the turning the water into wine, all right? And then uh, John 4, woman at the well, right? A less, little less than a full year. And this is according to that book that I showed you earlier today. Um, so, um, and then John 6, feeding of the 5,000, right? Is uh, possibly uh, a se the second year of his ministry, possibly near the end of his second year. Okay, so at this, John 6, Jesus has been with the disciples for two years, year and a half to two years. What does he expect them to know? Because they've had conversations. Is it too much to ask that they would? Sure, it's, it can't be too much to ask this, to, to, to expect them to respond to what he's teaching, right? There's an expectation that they would grow. And then in John 8, year 3, well into the third year of his discipleship ministry. Oh my gosh, John 11, raising of Lazarus, year 3, in the third year, near the end of the third year. The raising of Lazarus, right? And the, and the, there's just so many things there in that story. So um, this sheet is up here. So here we are, John 18, year three, the Garden of Gethsemane. The night before, you know, Jesus is saying, I'm going to go away. And, and, the, and the disciples say, hey, when you get to heaven, can I sit on your right hand? And I, and I sit on your other side? And he's like, you not listening? Have you not heard anything? This is why you, when you read through the Gospels and, and Jesus will say, how long do I have to be with you? Because you don't understand what I'm saying, right? You don't get it. This is the dynamic that you will go through with, you, with somebody that you're discipling because you're going to want them to get it. You're going to want them to understand. You're going to long your heart is going to hurt because they don't understand the kingdom of God. They, they, they don't understand what, who they are in Christ. And they keep making the same mistakes. And this is for you as a disciple maker to stay with them through that time. To come up underneath them and bear the weight. You bear the weight of their spiritual growth. By speaking truth to them, by encouraging them. I said, no, 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 you can't quit. I know you want to. I have to. We're not going to quit. Come on, let's go. And you call them up and you say, hey, you say I'm coming to get you. We're going to go get ice cream. 
and we're going to go get coffee. And, you're, and by doing that, by being with them, you're, you're bearing the weight. You've spent time with God. Now you can spend time with your disciples, bearing the weight of their, of their burden, of their spiritual growth. That's what God calls us to do. Mandel, because sometimes, for example, if I read the Bible, I've got an interpretation and I talk with somebody, that person have an interpretation too. Totally different than mine. Yeah. So if God talked to, to that person somehow and to me somehow, how we get to the point that it's the right thing for both of us? Yeah, I have, I have three hours worth of teaching on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for this morning, we we um, we say context is king. So on this sheet, you're going to see two most important questions. The first one is, what's the context? So with John chapter two, what's the context? It's a wedding. They're in a house um, in Cana, right? A bunch of people. We all know what a wedding is like. That's the context. And then the other. Most important question. This is called hermeneutics. This is what you, this is what you learn when you go to Bible college and seminary. This is simple hermeneutics. What's the context? The context could be walking by the Sea of Galilee. The context could be in the, in uh, the first few months of Jesus's ministry. The context could be uh, in a temple. Okay. So what's the context? Uh, and and so and then the other most important question is. What was the author's original intent? And that's on this, uh, this sheet for you. What is the author's original intent? If you read any at all, whether it's a newspaper or books, uh, there's going to be a conclusion statement at the end of a paragraph or at the end of a chapter. There's always a conclusion statement. And so <clears throat> uh, in John chapter two, verse 11, the conclusion statement is, and the disciples uh, believed in Jesus. So we got this story going on of, of, of the running out of wine and what do we do? And, and then he, he, they fill the jars, he turns it to wine. And then the conclusion is, and the disciples believed in Jesus. That's a reasonable conclusion to that story. John wrote it and put that phrase there so that we would be able to read the story and go, hey, well, how did it turn out? The disciples believed in Jesus. That's a conclusion statement. So there's more to this answer, but that's the nuts and bolts. Um, in my mind, that's the foundation. What is the context of the story? Because we don't want to take everything out of, out of context. And what is the author's original intent? The, the authors that wrote to us, they intended for us to have, uh, uh, to find the original meaning. And so they put it there. And then it's for me and you to do the rigorous work of, a, of, of someone who wants to be a good steward of God's word to find the original intent. And it's not mysterious. It's not, it's not uh, ethereal. Uh, it's not smoke and mirrors. It's a plain, we, all, we, we look for the plain, uh, simple language written on the black ink on the white page is, is the way we do it. And so I'm discipling this, this guy, you'll see his picture in a minute, and he's like, man, that's hard. That's hard. Because you have to think. <laughs> Right? You can't just, you can't. Now, these woke progressive preachers do, and man, can they draw a crowd, you know, 10,000 people in their church, 7,000 people in their church. Why? Because they tickle their ears. 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 and 4, time is coming when people are not going to listen to sound doctrine. They're not going to want to look for the context. They're not going to want to do the hard work of finding the author's original intent. They're going to find some, um, some uh, metaphor to tickle the ears of people and make them feel good. So, I just put some gold in your pocket. <laughs> so, the other thing is, so you spend time with God and then out of overflow, right? Out of overflow, you give to your disciple what God has given to you. So, all I really do is I just invite people into my life and I teach them about the kingdom of God. I just invite people like the wrestlers at Oconee High School. I just invite them into my life and teach them what I know about following Jesus. Right? And I start real simple. Like, y'all go to church or anything? And I thought, yeah, we go to church. And so there's my open door. Right? And, and so I said, well, you know, come on over to my house. We're going to have pancakes and Bible study. And they're like, yeah, go to the coach's house. And so they come over and I start discipling them. 
All right, so I'm, all I really do is just invite people into my life and then, and then teach them about the kingdom of God. And there's, of course, you always use coffee. Um, so out of overflow. So John chapter six, you got, if you can, yeah. John chapter six is um, the, the feeding of 5,000. So in a nutshell, here's what happens. Um, so you know the, the, the context, right? It's been a long day. Um, lots of people. Uh, they've been with them all day. Now they're hungry. What do we do? And so you got you got Jesus and you got the disciples and you got the 5,000 people. So watch. You got Jesus with the two fish and the bread. He's working a miracle. He says, tell the um, people to sit down. Right? And they're like, no. We need to tell them to go home. <laughs> don't mislead the people, Jesus. Don't tell them to. If you tell them to sit down, they're going to think they're going to get something. Don't, don't mislead them. Right? But he says, tell the people to sit down. And so the disciples are like, okay, I don't think I want to. Y'all sit down. <laughs> All right, so Jesus does a miracle. This is your quiet time. And this is what it looks like for you to receive from, G from God. As the Holy Spirit teaches you as you read God's word, you receive from God, you give to the people, and now you're like empty, you've, you've ministered, and now where do you go? You go back to Jesus. So you got Jesus making a miracle, you got the, the disciples, and then you got the 5,000 plus people, maybe 10, 12, 15,000 people. Jesus makes a miracle. He gives it to the disciples. The disciples receive from Jesus. Jesus the, the disciples go to the people and they and they they give to the people what Jesus gave to them. That's exactly what you need to do. Amen. You read God's word, you receive from him, and then you take it to wherever you work or wherever you live. It's that simple. Yeah. When I was discipling the, the FCA Fellowship of Christian Athletes, when I was discipling the, F, the FCA leadership team at at Union Grove Middle down in Henry County. I didn't have a curriculum other than this book, but I was going on mission trips with my church and I was listening to the pastor and I was, I was learning. And so I just taught them what I was learning. And that's all you need to do. In your walk with Jesus, you just teach, teach your disciple what you know about God. You're in a conversation with them and you're talking and, and you're drinking, drinking coffee and, and, they're, and they're beginning to trust you. Right? They're beginning to trust you. And so when the next time you say, how's it going? They say, not so good. And then they share and then you're able to pray for them. And, then, and they see that, that they can share with you. And they see how to pray. They see a, a man or a woman trusting God. And so now they have seen it lived out. And then you keep doing that. Oh gosh, there's so much more to say. So here's... So here's uh, Jesus and the disciples and the 5,000 and you, you receive from receive from Jesus by, by reading your Bible, praying, listen to the pastor, listen to Christian music, right? You're listening, you're learning and then you take what you learn to, to the world and when you, when you minister to your friend, I mean, you're not really empty, all right? But you gave them what you had, right? So now you, the disciples, they didn't have any more bread or fish in their hands so they came back to Jesus as is what I'm saying. But you come back to Jesus the next day in your quiet time and you read again. And what you get on, on Tuesday, you take it to work with you. Take it to the wrestling mat. Right? So y'all know I, I coach wrestling at Oconee High. I was a volunteer for seven years. All right, so that's what I, when I'm referring to the wrestlers, that's what I'm talking about. And that's what you do. So number three, so the short-term expectation. Number three in your notes on in the bulletin is short term. We just gonna go A to B, all right? We just gonna go A to B. That's, that, we can do that, can't we? If you've ever trained anybody in your occupation, you know that's the first thing you're gonna get lay a foundation. We're gonna go A to B. Do, just do the next thing. What's the next thing? Now for 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 your disciple, your their, their next thing might be come to church, and if they walk through that door, you you hoot and holler and pat them on the back, and say good job. Just do the next thing. I had a guy who was coming to my house for a Bible study and um, uh, discipleship time. I said, hey, man, how you doing? He said, I'm, I'm doing good. 
He said, I'm, I'm here. I said, man, that's good. You know, when you walk through that door, that was a success. He repeated that to me a couple years later. He said, I never forgot that you said I succeeded. I was making progress in my walk with Jesus when I walked through the, the door of your house. He showed up. Right? He said, no, and I, I don't drink on Tuesday. I don't drink on Sunday. Because Sunday I go to church. Tuesday I come to your house. I said, that's good, man. Way to go. Right? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So just do the next thing. We're just going to go A to B. A is wherever you are. B is uh, read your Bible. You're learning to read your Bible. Good. You came to church. You came to Tuesday night Bible study. A to B. Now your A to B is read your Bible. Did you read your Bible this week? I had this kid, this guy, that um, uh, he was in my Sunday school class. Every week I would ask these high school kids, did you read your Bible this week? They're high school boys. And, uh, and they would, <laughs> I would go around, you know, and they would say, uh, you had... Six times since I see, six days since I seen you last. Have you read your Bible? And they, they, they say, Yeah, I read mine five times. Good job. Read mine six times. Good job. I read mine three times. Good. And so, and so, years later, this guy graduates. Right now, he's got his master. Now he's got his doctorate. Right in in theology. And um, and I see him. We've been in uh, to Africa together. He said. He said. He said, Mr. Brad. He still called me Mr. Brad. He got a wife and two kids. He's Mr. Brad. I said, yeah. He said, you remember when I was in Sunday school and you used to ask uh, how, I, uh, how many times I read my Bible? I said, yeah. He said, you know, I lied several times. <laughs> yeah. I lied because I was embarrassed. Because I said I was a Christian, but I was embarrassed. I don't even read my Bible. <laughs> he said, I never forgot that, though. And I read it now every day. <laughs> you just never know the impact you're going to have on somebody's life while you just living a, a, a authentic Christian Christian life Amen. and just challenge them to go A to B, all right? So we're just going to go A to B. So uh, A to B, take the next step. Together, we're going to do it together, all right? That's it. Real simple. We're going to meet for coffee at McDonald's, all right? Tomorrow morning, whatever. A to B. Get from A to B by being an ongoing, healthy discipleship relationship. Ongoing means ongoing. It doesn't just mean once and you're done. Ongoing for a, for for a life for my life. I'm gonna I'm gonna have a, a lifestyle of, of making disciple makers, right? And then uh, healthy means uh, I'm gonna speak the truth. Yeah. I'm gonna ask you to forgive me when I hurt you, but I'm gonna speak the truth. That goes both ways, mm -hmm. right? Healthy. That's healthy. Lying is healthy. Nowadays we call it toxic. You, we got a toxic relationship with that person, right? Because it's corrosive and it hurts and it kills. So I'm not going to lie. I'm going to be in a healthy, ongoing, healthy discipleship relationship. Healthy means you can share what you're struggling with and you know the guy sitting across from you is not going to judge you. Or the lady sitting across from you, ladies. You know, when you talk about fear or insecurity or other things, if you, you, you stick your neck out like that, you will be okay. Because if that person is not able to handle that, I mean, some people can't, I guess. You can still be a friend to them, but it changes your relationship. But that's what you're after. You're after authenticity. Mm -hmm. World don't need fake Christians. Amen. You can see, you can spot a fake Christian a mile away. Guess what? Yeah. So can a lost man. That's right. Ongoing healthy discipleship relationship. That's what we're after. And then after we go A to B, we, what are we going to do? We'll just go B to C. You know, one, one step at a time. We're, going, we're just going to do the next thing. Right, see, that's not intimidating. A to Q is intimidating, right? A to X is intimidating. I can't do that, right? But I can, I can go A to B, especially if you're there with me. We're going to do the next thing. So I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with Invisalign. Uh, this is uh, Invisalign. You, we all know what braces are. You know what, everybody know what Invisalign is? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is my favorite illustration. And this, this illustrates the process. So this is the original tray 
from one of my daughters. Uh, they don't approve of all my object lessons. <laughs> don't take that to church, Dad. I got to. It's good. <laughs> so here, so here's the thing, right? You got, yeah. you got a mouth, and what, let's just say one. Don't we all wish we just had one crooked tooth, right? Well, we got one crooked tooth, and it's crooked. And so they take a digital picture, right? The they, the dentist says, they send it away, and they get what's called a tray, mm -hmm. right? And that tooth that's crooked is turned just a little bit, right? A to B, one one step at a time. Right? That tooth that's crooked is turned just a little bit in the right direction. You put it in, and it hurts, gives you a headache. For the first day or two, then it stops because the, the tray is turning just like this book is turning your life. Right. This book is turning your emotions, your affections. This book is turning your thinking, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. right, so you slowly reading God's word and it's slowly turning uh, you in the right direction. Right? So so after a few days, you wait for, I think, 14 days. I don't know. But after a few days, it stops hurting and the tooth keeps turning. Into them. And then what, what happens? In two weeks, they send you another um, another tray. And what about that, that tooth right there? It's turned again. You take the new tray, you put it in. What happens? It hurts. Mm -hmm. it hurts for a day or two. Right? Then it stops. You keep wearing it for two weeks. And you keep receiving and keep wearing it. And, keep, and it keeps turning slowly. It just keeps slowly turning you have to be if you're going to be a follower of jesus you have to be willing to be turned by this book as you're following jesus right and and continuing to the bible says a righteous man falls down six six times he gets up what seven seven you got to keep getting up amen if you're born again you're going to persevere yeah. right that's the that's the encouragement that you give to your disciple because they're because they're they're struggling, All right? This process we're going to join in the process, and this is what we think our, our life is going to be like. I mean, we, if any man's in Christ, in Second Corinthians uh, seven fourteen, I think it's right, it's seven fourteen. I don't know. Um, uh, if, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. I mean, if you're born again, you know what it's like to have the weight of sin released. I remember, I remember the day I got saved, man. I felt so good. I was like, are you, are you kidding me? And I, I asked the preacher down in Jonesboro. I said, what happened if I sin again? He gave me 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, you know, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. I'm really, I can be saved and stay that way. And he said, yeah. I'm like, man, this is good. I feel, I feel good, right? And that's what I thought the Christian life was going to be like. And then come, I was in high school. Right? And then, then comes this reality sets in. Yeah. Right? And it's, in my life, it's just I'm making all kinds of mistakes. I wish I'd had somebody disciple me back then. Yeah. I did have a coach. Uh, he was, um, but it was, he wasn't like a, purposeful, intentional discipleship relationship. But, um, but eventually we mature, and even though we have our ups and downs, we're still moving forward. Mm. And that's that last line of what our life uh, can look like. And why is this? I mean, like Paul said, the good that I want to do, I don't do. But guess what? The evil that I don't like, I, that's what I do. I keep doing the stuff I don't want to do. Right. And this is why we have to have uh, uh, you in um, walking alongside, coming up underneath to help bear the weight of, of your disciple because he's going to go through this. And you got to be there saying, did you, did you give your life to Jesus? Are you born again? And he's going to say, yes, I did. And I'm, okay, with that, because the word of God is true, let's keep moving forward. And then you get to show him, hey, Paul, the apostle, he struggled. Peter, he was a hothead saying things that, that uh, were hurtful, doing things that were stupid. So, and guess what? I have two, so let's just keep walking together. Amen. So your spiritual growth and your uh, progress as a believer, is, it was one that was purchased uh, by Christ on the cross. He satisfied the justice and, and, and displayed the mercy of God, right? And the patience of God on the cross. All right, we are bought with a price, right? My name written in the book, 
All right. But now it's for me, like Paul said, to work out my salvation. I'm going to work out what has been given to me in my daily life. I'm going to choose to choose what's right, what's, what's in this book. And when I see that I might be using God's grace so that I can sin, I'm going to stop that too, because that's not right. I'm going to become the mature believer that I ought to be by recognizing when I'm abusing God's grace. I don't want to be like that. So your spiritual growth as a believer is one in, a, in your head. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I'm renewing my mind. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 and 5, I'm rejecting what is a lie and I'm, I'm receiving what's true. You should write down all these verses that are at the bottom of this. They're going to be on the next couple slides. But yeah, I don't live by my feelings. I don't live by my experience. So, so this is kind of like what a little diagram that I that I drew up. You know, they were. This has to do with being in an ongoing healthy relationship. So I'm renewing my mind. I'm learning to uh, to be in fellowship, and I'm I'm um, rejecting lies, and I'm receiving truth, and I'm choosing to choose what is objectively true in God's word. And so in that long lifelong process, how many of y'all? How many of y'all been? Uh, I was gonna say married. How many of y'all been saved? Um, more than 20 years saved more than 30 years saved more than 40 years more, saved more than 50 years oh my gosh it's a process isn't it Amen. And you don't want to quit you don't want to give up just because you failed I mean deep down inside there's this thing that wants you wants to think that God will forgive you and guess what he does and then you want, to, you want to be like Paul and, and say, I'm not going to be like the person who abuses the grace of God. That's a good faith place to find yourself. When you say, I will not abuse the grace of God. I'm going to repent of this and I'm crushed under the weight of the love of God. I can't believe that, it, that he really will love me, but he does. And I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep following. All right, it's 1225. I appreciate your patience. I'm going to be done in another 40, 45 minutes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'll be done for that. I'll be done. But here we go. Oh, so number four. All right. Uh, long-term objective. The long-term objective in, in somebody that you're a disciple is you, you want them to become a, a reproducing disciple maker. The things that I'm giving to you, you give to them for the purpose of I'm giving it to you so that you'll grow, but you're giving it to them so they'll be able to learn how to re read their Bible for, the, for themselves. All right, so making disciple makers, going to all the world to make disciples, you're going to receive power to do that. All right, and then these, these men have turned the world upside down. Have you, have you turned the world upside down where you, where you live, in your neighborhood, and, and the people that you know? Okay, the disciples, were, they were not confused about what to do when Jesus said, go make this. Isn't that amazing? They were not confused. We, we, we like to come in and sit down and listen. Right, and, that, and then there's a place for that, and you ought to do that. Right, but I'm just saying the disciples were not confused about what to do when Jesus said, "Go to make disciples." They didn't form an opinion. They didn't call a committee. They didn't search the internet for you know what does it mean to go make disciples. They didn't do any of that. They just went, and then they taught the the, the people that they went to what Jesus told them in the Great Commission. Teaching them all the things that I've commanded you uh, to, to obey and baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They did that. They knew where to go and they knew what to do. So the clearest, listen, the clearest, most accurate understanding of what Jesus meant is what the disciples did. Hmm. So as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. So Jesus, God sent Jesus sacrificially as a servant to the world to make disciples. Jesus sent his disciples sacrificially as servants to the world to make disciples, to share the gospel. And now I got me here down on this third column. What about my life? Does my life look like I've been sent by Jesus? Good question to ask yourself. This is this is exponential growth. You know, you got your disciples and you're, you're teaching your disciples and, and your disciples are going to train other disciples. So the big question is, what, what is the obvious thing that I can do, that Brad can do to make disciple makers? Well, I use the, my, my ability to coach, coach wrestling. 
right? My house, invite them over. Uh, carpentry, know, know how to work with wood. I'm gonna teach some guys how to how to cut wood, how to make things out of, out of wood. Leather craft, I join a motorcycle. I look like a motorcycle gang guy, don't I? <laughs> yeah, motorcycle, well, what about you? I don't know what you what you can do, what your skill or what your hobby is, hunting, fishing, um, ladies, the things that you guys do. Maybe y'all hunt and fish too, I don't know. I don't, ladies hunt and fish, I suppose. But whatever you do that you like doing, say, God, how, how can I use this to impact a young lady's life? And, and I'm going to start reading my Bible and use this simple Bible study sheet. And I'm going to make some copies of some blank ones. And I'm going to, I'm going to teach, and they're going to come over to my house. I'm going to find me three girls. I'm just going to use you as an example. I'm going to find me three girls that I can, I can pour into. I'm listening to pastors. Uh, sermons. I'm studying with Brad's Bible study sheet, and I got some girls coming over to my house, and I'm going to teach them, and then we're going to have a Bible study. Boom. Discipleship. Okay, there's your opportunity, and your current relationships are the most, I mean, there's other ideas, but um, there you go. So you use your house and your work, your church, go to the world, the things you've heard and seen in me, teach the faithful men who, who will teach others. I'm gonna zip through these right here. So here's a overnight Bible study. I took these guys on Bible study. These are guys that I'm discipling. A guy down there on the bottom left, David, he started discipling somebody. He sent me a text. He said, hey man, I just want you to know I, I started discipling somebody. I'm like, praise God, man. These other guys, and there he is. There's old Zach, we're sitting together. During COVID, I had a workout in Bible study with Coach Holloway. We'd be down at the pool, and, and we, we had, I had all these different uh, stations we'd work out, and we'd have a little 10-minute Bible study, and a character coach at, uh, at the wrestling, and then there's where I have them over to my house, and these are my, my buddies down in McDonough. These guys are all grown. One of them's in the military, and uh, right now, here's the old guy that came over, the grown men that came over, and This was Union Grove Middle School. Here we are. I'm, I, I, the first week, I teach the guys on my in my leadership team how to how to read, how to share the gospel. And then the next FCA huddle meeting, school wide FCA huddle meeting, the guys that I'm teaching are teaching their friends. So that's what that is right there. Okay, there in the jungles, and there we go. There's me and preaching. So that's what we do. Thank you for your patience, and I'm going to pray for you, and then and we'll. We'll go. Lord, thank you so much for um, today, God. Thank you for what you're doing in our hearts. And I pray, God, your blessing on these people as they love you and, and, uh, and continue to grow and follow you and, and learn, God, that you would use them mightily in the kingdom of God uh, to make disciples and fulfill the great commission. We love you, God, and give ourselves away for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Let's give our prayer. Thanks. I believe we've heard the word of the Lord for this church, dear folks. This is the future. This is the future of State of United. I still call it the wrong name. State of Methodist Church. <laughs> we are going to go into the future, disciple makers, being discipled ourselves. I need to be discipled. Just because I'm the pastor, I need to be discipled. I need to be an ongoing student of the word. I'm not going to hold you much longer. I just want you to keep a couple of things in mind. I hope we have an ongoing relationship with Coach Brad. We want you to come back. I want you to come back over and over. Check on us and tune us up. And in the very near future, I don't want to name it today, but let's look at our schedules. What I had in mind going into this, and Coach and I talked about this, having a Saturday morning. That just comes to mind because it's a good time for everybody to get together. Come together. Let's fix a breakfast in the fellowship hall. And we'll all talk some more about this in more in a small group setting where we can actually Q&A, and then we can also see how God's going to make this thing happen. It's unique to every church and every situation, isn't it, Pastor? It, it, will, uh, it will take its own form. But God's got a plan for this, and I can't wait to see what He's going to do. So y'all be thinking about that.